Ok, excelente. Again, welcome to the Mensury Advisory Members introductory webinar. It will take us approximately um, uh, one hour to run all the session. I will try to keep it in time, so that's also a request I'm sending to our speakers in order not to go too further from the uh, time planned. Um, today we will be covering a series of elements. I will be starting by providing a very uh, short introduction, giving you a couple of words um, about the Mensi project and the advisory board uh, membership. Um, then we'll have a, a short presentation in relation to the work package to uh, results and, and let's say what's going on, uh, state of art in terms of school-to-school uh, -school mentoring in Europe. Uh, we have decided to divide the Q&A sessions in two so that the session was a bit more interactive. So we will allow some time uh, after the first two presentations and then at the very end, of course, you can keep your questions from one session or another and and feel free to post your questions in the chat in the in the meantime too. Uh, then we will continue uh, with an example of the of the what's happening uh, with Mensi at the national level and, and one of the partners uh, has been very kind also to provide an idea of how we're working with the schools at the, at the national level. Uh, and we will continue again with another example of some of the policy issues discussed uh, in the project, such as uh, the smaller and rural schools. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, we will allow some time uh, for discussion and questions. Well, about Mensi, uh, just to let you know that Mensi stands for Mentoring for School Improvement. The project has started quite recently, right before the, the Christmas break. So it was launched in November 2020 and, and, and is a, a project supported by the Horizon 2020 uh, framework. We will carry out a pan-European investigation uh, in relation to different approaches of mentoring and how this can support the mainstreaming of uh, innovative digital teaching practices. We have presence in terms of uh, uh, pilot schools in six uh, European countries and the idea is to create a network of uh, 24 mentor schools who are the advanced schools that will be uh, mentoring uh, 96 uh, other schools in total. So this is four times four uh, on the different uh, countries. Of course, by the end of the project, uh, we are aiming to open the network to any other school uh, interested in applying uh, this uh, school mentoring approaches, not only in the countries uh, that are part of the program, but also via online involvement in, in any other school across Europe and beyond that may be uh, interested. More specific in relation to the partners, well, I'm hereby representing uh, European Schoolnet. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we are a network of ministers of education at the at the European level, and one of the many actions that we engage is in the development uh, of European projects, but it's also part of the network. We are working with different ministries, regional authorities and universities. So we have uh, Indire from Italy, the Ministry of Education in Croatia, also the Ministry of Education in, uh, in Portugal, the Search National Agency uh, for International Education and Research. We have uh, GO, uh, which is a, a, an educational network of schools uh, here in the in the Flames part of, of, of Belgium, um, the Educational Authority in Hungary, and Brunel University uh, London. Very briefly, because we will have more time in the next presentation to discuss about the, the state of art, but just to let you know well, the background a bit of the project. Well, it's not a, it's not new to say that. Uh, uh, transfer and scaling of uh, innovative approaches uh, to how we use technology in school has been and is a policy, ch a policy challenge uh, across Europe. Uh, in this regard, you probably have more examples of peer-to-peer um, -peer networking uh, as a very effective mechanism when it comes to the individual uh, teacher level, so teacher-to-teacher. -teacher. 
However, it seems that at the whole school level, this is the school as an organization, despite the, the evidence uh, for potential in this area, there is not that many experiences um, in this regard. And that's why one of the reasons also uh, the Commission has, uh, has launched uh, this type of call uh, in order to investigate uh, and push a bit further uh, the initiatives uh, covering school to school mentoring. Key objectives of the project and um, well, everything that has to do with investigating school to school mentoring and theory of practice, as we already mentioned, then, of course, to analyze the effectiveness uh, of this uh, whole school mentoring approaches via uh, our piloting in the different uh, countries. Uh, this will allow us uh, to create uh, a network of uh, over 100 mentor and mentee schools as we mentioned before and the idea is that by the end of the period we'll be able to provide of course evidence-based uh, recommendations and guidelines that can be useful uh, not only for practitioners but also for uh, policy makers and in parallel throughout all this process we will create a community of practice and professional development that will be hopefully helpful again uh, to all the educational community and what is this that we are expecting? These are, of course, the, the major outcomes. There will be many more, but if we have to summarize them in, in five, well, the overview of schools to school mentoring in Europe, which we are briefly presenting uh, today in the following session, have disorganized 24 clusters of schools in the, in the partner countries. Again, experimenting with different whole school uh, mentoring approaches, while at the same time, documenting and analyzing uh, all these mentoring practices and towards the end of the project launching a, a MOOC, a massive open online course uh, that will be linked to a community of practice for, for practitioners. In terms of the project timeline, uh, I mentioned earlier that the project was launched in November 2020. We are finalizing the first phase of the project that was mostly connected to the well, the overall preparation, but also the, the school selection in the different countries and this uh, overview of school to school mentoring in Europe. And the next major phase is going to be launched in September 21. That's why it's also very important for you uh, to be engaged from this point uh, onwards, because in September is when we'll be launching uh, not only the, the, the school pilots in the six different countries, but we we'll also start experimenting with the different uh, whole school mentoring approaches and uh, analyzing uh, these mentoring practices. And as I mentioned earlier, also um, to keep in mind uh, the MOOC to be launched in October uh, 2022, although that's still uh, a bit far to think about, but it's still good to keep it in, in, in mind. Um, having said so, connected to the purpose of the meeting today, uh, well, we would like all of you to join us uh, as part of um, our advisory uh, members. As you may have seen, I don't know if you know um, most of the attendees, but well, I can already tell you that we have quite a, a, a variety of registrations for today. Uh, we are targeting Ministry of Education, regional and uh, municipal education authorities, um, organizations working in the area of school to school mentoring, other EU funded projects uh, covering similar topics, but of course, uh, many others that cannot be mentioned. Uh, this is not an exclusive uh, list, but private organizations, foundations, associations that may be interested in the in the overall topic of school to school mentoring, but also on the other uh, specific policy challenges that the project is um, targeting. In terms of the benefits, which of course is something that I guess uh, would be also uh, interesting, especially for you. Well, of course, the opportunity to network not only within the six participating countries of the project, but within all the other uh, advisory members that will be uh, joining the project from all over Europe and, and beyond. Uh, participating to this uh, more, uh, mentoring policy exchange mechanism that for the moment due to the circumstances is taking place online but hopefully in the future we will be also running um, our activities uh, face to face physically uh, being part 
of the advisory member uh, group, you will be also part of the decision making mechanism and you will be participating in the in the general assemblies, having early access to the results and the deliverables of the of the project, being involved in the professional development opportunities. Uh, and again, gaining yourself as an organization um, visual identity and relevance uh, in terms of the capacity of advisory board member and being represented uh, officially uh, within the Nancy website as advisory members uh, too. This is just a small taste of the things that we thought of, but uh, of course I'm sure there will be many other opportunities. I've added the, the link and I'm going to kindly ask Elena if possible to uh, post again in the chat the, the two links that are uh, here below. If not, I will post them in the next couple of minutes. So one is the charter for advisory members that most of you should have received probably within the invitation where we provide more details about the uh, advisory members. And then the form, in case uh, you haven't done so yet, uh, to to become advisory members. Um, and having said so, I give now the floor to Roger Blamer, who will be giving you uh, a bit more details about school to school mentoring in Europe and, and the results of uh, of the work package uh, too. So thank you so much. And Roger, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Enrique, could you keep control and just change the logistics sure. slides and make sure everything will work smoothly? So nice to see so many people interested in uh, this topic. And um, as Enrique said, this is really just a, a taste of what there is in the project and what um, we're learning as, as the project unfolds. Um, so uh, please excuse the kind of sketchy details, perhaps. But I have just six slides to, sh to, to share with you, which summarise um, the key points in one of our early deliverables, um, uh, an inquiry into mentoring and collaboration between schools in Europe. And you'll notice from that first um, headline on the uh, title slide, the, the word mentoring is tied in with other words like cooperation, collaboration, networking, and so on. And um, if the, there is a strong overlap between the different uh, terms and uh, it's certainly not clear cut at all. Enrique, if you can move on. So the, the wider context of mentoring um, includes uh, other activities which aren't strictly speaking mentoring. Why do, why do schools cooperate in general terms? And perhaps um, as European Commission report, um, observed there are five particular reasons to solve complex problems which one school alone cannot solve, to share responsibilities where a school might be small for example, so pooling resources, to incubate pro policy, this notion of incubator is a nice one where something experimental and in innovative is, is tried out and it, there may be risks in terms of unexpected outcomes and with children and learning, it's important not uh, to mitigate those risks, which can be done by collaboration. Scaling innovation, as Enrique already said, is very much what this project is about. And the, the, the sixth one, fifth one, sorry, is the professional development of teachers. Um, that's the one area of research where benefits are clearly shown that if schools work together, um, it can help the professional development of teachers. The outcome for students and learning um, is less clear, so we will focus on teacher development. Next slide, please. In Mensi, um, there are already, or there have been, a number of projects which can come under the heading of partnerships, if not mentoring. And they, they fit a number of those categories we've already looked at. Um, school improvement in general, um, there's, there's a project in Hungary. The capacity building of teachers um, is, is exemplified in at least four countries in the uh, partnership already. And um, some of them focus on teachers, some of them focus on school leaders. We'll come back to that. Fostering innovation, the list gets longer. Um, 
and they look at different aspects of innovation, um, particularly ped pedagogical approaches, but also eco schools, for example. Um, sharing concerns, uh, the small isolated schools, we'll hear more about those um, later in this uh, uh, workshop. And um, digital technologies, which is the, one of the particular focus of, of this project, um, there have already been activities in a number of countries and um, uh, of course outside the project partners as well. This is often a focus. Living Schools Lab, next slide please, was one project which is the, if you like, the godfather of this project. Um, this took place a few years ago, again with European Commission funding, and the, the review of it at the end of the project was very positive. So it was felt that the model developed in this um, project is, is ripe to be uh, adopted in, in other projects. And so Mensi is, is not starting from scratch, but building on this project. Um, six features are described there. In a way, it's a top-down project because there is an incentivization incentivization for schools to take part in terms of funding. Um, it was top down by managed by uh, national coordinators and uh, ministries rather than schools themselves. It had a hub and spoke model um, where there was an advanced school or two advanced schools per country and let's say less advanced schools where innovation was less um, consistent across the school. Um, a use of common framework uh, to, to develop professionally the schools, of course steps, and um, resulted in a framework for mainstreaming change. And um, the, the evaluation showed that uh, it created a lot of benefits. One feature of the lab that we can't replicate this time is that uh, the evaluator of the project, one of the partners um, from the UK, clocked up about 15, 20,000 air miles, actually visiting the schools and observing mentoring taking, taking place. Um, hard work for her, but very useful to see, but impossible in the present circumstances. Moving on, please. That's top-down collaboration then, more or less initiated outside schools um, and uh, structured and led uh, externally. There are fewer examples of bottom-up collaboration, partly because um, it's ad hoc and it could be small scale, one school with another in a, in a remote part of the country, um, in a way that there's no need for central government to know about it and, and the publicity or marketing dissemination mechanisms aren't in place. That's not to say um, it's, it's not important. And um, in a way, there's, there's an overlap between top down and bottom up in that the schools taking part in collaboration um, have some autonomy, they choose to take part and uh, they commit staff and people and leadership to make things happen. The examples we have in the report um, talk about uh, schools within a self-improving system. So um, it's, it's where teachers and schools and all involved in it reflect on their progress, their achievements, and um, learn as, as time goes on. So they, they can be called learning schools, um, where not only learners learn, but teachers do as well. And there's an atmosphere and a culture of experimentation. Example already exists in, in the Czech Republic, um, but there are others as well. Self-review is a key element, so the school needs to know where it's strong, where it's weak. And now since the Living Schools Lab project, the um, self-evaluation tool Selfie has become widely um, used, particularly for digital competences and readiness. And that is something which um, is, will no doubt feature in this project. But self-review is one thing, um, but peer review is another. And that's where we, we begin to look more formally at mentoring in that 
if one school or people in one school, leadership, middle management, practitioners, uh, classroom teachers, observe each other, um, it becomes a critical friend approach and um, can perhaps be more objective than self-evaluation. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of mentoring between schools, um, perhaps the second bullet is the most important. This comes from research that it is said to be as a whole school basis, not widespread and little research. So we're, we're, we're treading new territory here, which sounds strange, but one of the reasons perhaps is the policy move in many countries for school autonomy and competition between schools, um, which makes collaboration more difficult. But when it happens um, on a whole school basis, it's in a way scaled up from the mentoring of, of uh, newly qualified teachers, which is very widespread and based on somebody with more experience sharing it with someone less. I mean, that's exaggerating, but it's it's supporting and enabling to, to grow. Um, but if you unpack that, there are a lot of issues, of course, to explore. Um, so the, the reflection promoted by mentoring uh, promotes collaborative learning cultures and that obviously doesn't happen easily and quickly and uh, there's a need for time for these things to, to, to develop. Um, when mentoring takes place uh, it's important to fit it into the <coughs> school context and culture. Uh, so it helps if schools have development plans in place uh, and then they can see in what way mentoring with another school, either as mentee or mentor, can benefit the school. And it's important to stress that mentoring should benefit both the mentor and the mentee. And it's in a project like this, quite a challenge to, to provide a benefit for the mentoring school, as well as the mentoring, mentored school. The, the support of school leaders is essential. Um, and that almost needs to be in place before mentoring starts. So a collaborative culture, a framework for things to happen and um, training in mentoring. Um, uh, just because people are good teachers doesn't mean they're good mentors. There are different skills and it's partly working with adults. It's working with fellow professionals. So the power relationship is, is very different. Finally, let's have a brief look, please, Enrique, at the uh, success conditions identified in the research um, on collaboration and mentoring and so on. And <clears throat> uh, reduced to six and very much simplified, of course, uh, leadership, if not from the school head, who, who may have many other things to do and may delegate responsibility for mentoring, but it, it nevertheless needs to be somebody in the school who takes control of the um, partnership. And that person needs to have a, a, a with, with others, develop a clear plan, but that plan needs to be agreed and understood. And um, I've added incentives provided. That's what we're looking at more in Menses than Living Schools Lab, um, to see what, what it is that encourages schools to, to take part. And it's certainly not just about money. Number two um, is processes and structures, clarity about the roles and responsibilities. In a way, it's the same with any project, but it's particularly important with mentoring. And this notion of training as well. It needn't take long, but some sort of preparation is, is required. Number three is a bit tricky. That, um, mentoring works best if Schools have already worked together on something else, but that's not always possible and not possible in this project. So um, trust needs to be built up. Number four is um, communication as always needs to be clear, but the idea that the benefit uh, from taking part is clear and the taking part has to be dependent on a promise almost that a problem faced by um, 
the school or the teachers is going to be fixed and, and that could be assessment uh, special needs or perhaps in our case um, digital technology but it can't be kind of wish thinking the schools need to be carefully matched and in mentoring and mentees there's a, a power there can be a power imbalance and that is important to get right from the start that it needs to be a learning partnership where everybody taking part has something to offer other people um, it, it may take some time to bring this out of a school that feels less developed technologically but nevertheless it needs to take part it needs to take place and finally then it, the way we're working in particular requires a good uh, infrastructure and um, competence in terms of using it uh, by those taking part. In, the, in this project, there won't be very much face-to-face -face working, much more online than previously um, as a result of the pandemic, but also uh, the development of new tools and applications. So I hope that made sense. Just uh, I need to stop now, Enrique. But uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, comments and reactions on this, or more generally, the, the advisory board um, presentation, now is the time, please. Enrique. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much. Yes, as Roger said, I, I haven't had the chance, let me yet to check in the chat if you already have any uh, comment or, or reaction. Otherwise, uh, now we can have a couple of minutes if you have any doubts in relation to the well, to the general approach of the advisory members, but also to the uh, to the different elements that uh, Roger presented. Otherwise, um, so I can already see. Can you explain? Can you please explain what it is meant by the whole uh, school basis mentoring? Thanks. Is it possible to have new schools involved in the project? So I will give Mayu the first one to you, Roger, to the whole school basis mentoring. Yeah, that, that's a really crucial question. Um, and that's why, as I said, it's, it's under-researched and it's not very widespread. Because when it comes down to it, a school is not an entity that has any agency. It's the people within it. So although we're talking about whole schools, we're talking about key people or identified people within a school. But the, the, the reason we call it whole school is that the issue we are trying to tackle uh, relates to everybody in the school, not just individuals. So we're not talking about a teacher of geography pairing with a teacher of geography in another school and, and learning from each other or uh, developing. It, it's very much um, the whole school has a mechanism within the school to benefit from partnership with with one or more other schools and that's that's why it's a challenge and tricky but that's also why if it works it opens up the door to to systemic um, renewal and um, improvement okay thank you roger yes in relation to the second question by um who was it, sir? It's uh, Hugo Caldeira. So, and, and not now for the for the piloting phase, of course, because uh, schools have been uh, directly selected via our partners. But yes, in the future, for sure. Now we are currently uh, designing the different strategies, and besides the online and the uh, international elements that we mentioned before, for instance, connected to the online community and the MOOC, uh, there will be certainly activities organized. Uh, uh, by the by the partners at the national level I mean to involve further schools outside of the of the piloting uh, uh, networks um, there's a question by uh, Nora Marquetos Marquetos saying have you included some of the findings of the UK research schools network which is um, a lot about school mentoring um, that's a, an, another really useful question. Nora, perhaps if you could post a link in the chat, uh, we can follow it up just to make sure. But I'm actually based in the UK and my background is, is teaching and research in, in the UK. Um, so the report does mention 
UK activities because, it, as I see it anyway, there are particular, it exemplifies many of the differences between top down command and control approaches and, and bottom up um, networking um, informal approaches, and both of which uh, take place in England and, and the UK more generally. Um, the, the research schools, as far as I know, is very much like the Mensi model uh, in that these would be more advanced schools. And I, as I understand it, they're funded by government um, to host visits and promote um, networking and, and learning from other schools. So it's very much, in a way, mentor-mentee, but perhaps a little bit less systematic than we're planning in Mensi in that there are only a small number of schools working with only one school and they're working together over time to, to make changes happen. But yeah, there are in the report, there are examples from other countries outside the, the, um, the project, of course, um, but I wanted to focus very much on what's happening inside the project. Okay, thank you, Roger. And thank you, Nora, also for, for, for sharing. Just maybe I will take the last two questions and then we can uh, continue with the session and leave the rest of the questions to the to the final q a in order to keep uh, um, the timing so uh, carmen lozano I, I, yes the piloting will all only be taking place uh, in the piloting countries of course the partner countries but the remaining activities will be open to to schools um, elsewhere and not only in the piloting countries um, we have our questions, hello Conferencia, can you tell us something more on training mentors and... Uh, um, I'll deal with that one you? first, um, Enrique. Okay. Uh, the other one's fascinating too. Um, yeah, good morning Croatia, <laughs> sounds like Eurovision. Um, training the mentors, yes, uh, this arises in a way from other work we're doing working very closely with mentoring um, early career teachers in Belgium in a different project. Um, but the evidence on that is very much that um, teachers need need help in, in training, in, in working with other teachers. Um, in particular, it's, uh, I mean, we don't have a program as such, um, but training the mentors involves helping people to, to have what, what, what are called professional conversations in Ireland, where they, they have a very strong mentoring um, uh, process. Um, and professional conversations are structured dialogues between professionals in which um, sensitive topics are exposed, such as weaknesses in teaching, as well as strengths, and, and enabling people to talk about how they might improve what they're doing without making them feel inadequate. So it's a lot about human relationships and uh, negotiation, um, which are you know, it's the kind of skills that need to be um, learned rather than naturally acquired. The, the, the weakness of mentoring can be if the mentor feels they know everything, they become a bit um, overconfident, let's say, you know, I've been here, I've done it all, you're a beginner, you're not as good as me. And that kind of relationship can be really dangerous. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and thank you, Nora, for sharing too. Um, the idea, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep your question for the second session because you are talking about digital fatigue. And it's something that has actually been identified as, as one of the um, risks in the project, no, with all this <laughs> activity running online and, and, and not only this, but the fact that we are focusing on, on digital uh, innovation. So I will keep your question for the second Q&A and in this way we can also open the floor to our other uh, two speakers uh, to join the discussion. So thank you, uh, please. Can I yes. just say thank you to Nora for the link, um, Education Endowment Foundation. The, the evaluator in this project is from Brunel University. Sure. And he's actually very well connected to, to UK research. So one way or another, we'll, we'll pick that up. Thank you. OK, thank you all. And uh, that I promise to, to pick up your question first in the in the second round of Q&A. So having said so, we now move on 
to the second part of the session in which we are giving specific examples in this case um, about the action and the and the partners involved at the at the national level so i'm going to allow uh, Sam to take control of the presentation. So Sam, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is uh, Sam. I'm the national coordinator um, for Mansi in uh, Flanders in Belgium. Oh. I'm trying to, yes, okay, great. Um, so for, first of all, what's GEO? Uh, GEO is one of the um, education networks of Flanders and Flanders is um, a part, the Dutch speaking part, of Belgium and maybe as you know Belgium is a very complicated country uh, we speak three different languages Dutch French I don't know uh, if it's um, on your computer Enrique but I see a, a really big gray it's oh. fine to me I'm not sure what you refer but we can see it clearly maybe. it's a it's a problem at my computer sorry okay. um, and uh, yeah, education in Flanders is divided in, in three networks and GEO is the uh, second largest network. Um, but I have a video, I brought a video to um, tell you more about GEO. Enrique, can you start it? Because yes, okay. I don't have any sounds. There was sound from our side, eh? uh, Sam? Ah, okay. I don't know if the rest hear something, but I don't, I, I don't. Uh, no, no, we can't listen to. Okay, I'm not really sure um, about that, maybe. We can, you can open it directly in, in YouTube in your computer and, and share your screen directly. Um, well, I to, yeah, it's 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 complicated, compli complicated because I can't share my sound on a Mac computer, but I will share oh. it in the chat afterwards. So okay. uh, you guys have the information. Then uh, I'll continue with the presentation. All right, uh, so. Uh, GEO is the second largest network um, of schools um, in Flanders. Uh, autonomy is a is really important for us. Uh, there is a lot of autonomy for the schools. Uh, it's one of the main principles, key principles. Um, but the ministry defines the general rules and the financial means, and GEO de determines the project, um, the, uh, provides counseling for the schools, and so on. Um, our, our network is, um, is divided in 26, not 27, but 26 school groups. Um, each school group exists of um, 20, 30 schools and they work together. They learn from each other. They do, they do all the things together. Um, so working together, networking, mentoring is in our DNA, is in the DNA of GEO. It, for the Mansi project, 20 geo schools will um, will join the project, and we also have uh, me. I work for uh, geo and I provide a, a service for the schools counseling, and then we have my colleagues Jens and Azizi who also work for geo uh, as central support and policy making. Uh, we have a vision on professional learning environments. Uh, we think it's really important, um, but the most important thing why we do this is to improve the student education and outcomes. We always do it for the student, but also, yeah, teachers have stronger belief in their own abilities. Um, they improve teaching and learning practices at school level and so on, but always with the student, with improving student education in mind. Um, yeah, our vision is that we speak of a prof professional learning community when the education professional in school engage in a, in a sustained way 
individual and collaborative. They uh, think critical in a reflective way and always with the aim to improve student education and student outcomes. Uh, we have some experience with mentoring and networking. Past years, we saw a really big increase in the creation of networks and hubs on various topics. Uh, a network on the use of ad tech platforms, on digital education, on infrastructure, and so on. And not only on digital topics. We see a variation in bottom-up and top-down networks, mostly top-down networks, but some are bottom-up. And we see them happen in schools, in school groups, but also at geo level, at Flanders level. But they stop after a while for various reasons. Um, and our big question is, how can we make those networks, those hubs sustainable? And that's also a reason why we are part of this project. But also we are a partner in this project because the Mansi project is a perfect match with our vision and our strategic plan. Uh, we want to improve personalized learning. We want to improve our blended and hybrid learning. And we want students, teachers and schools to learn from each other. Like Roger said, it's, it's, it's a fact that, that learning from each other works. And we are convinced that our schools do a lot of great things and also have done a lot of great things uh, past years. And now it's the time to share this knowledge, to share this experience with each other in a sustainable way. Um, we also want to improve the digital competence of our teachers and our school leaders. Eh? There is a strong um, need uh, of digital skills, but also knowledge, infrastructure, leadership, visions, and so on, for various reasons. And also di digitalization is a lever to personalized learning. In our country, we have also something that's called the Digispoon. Um, our Minister of Education uh, made 375 million euros available to give every student from the fifth grade a known device. He also wants to um, yeah, invest in, in, in the IT skill, the developing of IT skills for teachers, better digital content. So it's really uh, those, uh, yeah, those digital competence of teachers is really important for us. Um, we started a couple of months ago in the project. Uh, what, did, what steps did we, did we already take? Uh, we contributed in the literature study uh, led by the UN and by um, by Roger uh, on mentoring, incentives, and so on. Um, we did some preparation on the policy, on finance, GDPR, but we also invested in promotion. Internal, so what and why Mansi, but also we're looking for matches with other projects. External, uh, we did also some promotion. Uh, we did a call for schools, for mentor schools and for trainee schools. Uh, we held an info session for schools. Um, there were 24 candidate schools and we already selected 20 of them. And we formed four hubs with those schools. Uh, let me tell you something more about those hubs. Uh, our first hub are primary schools. Eh? A hub exists of five schools, one mentor and four trainee schools. The first hub exists of, of schools from one school group. They already work together, but they want to level up to improve their mentoring and networking practice. Our second hub is secondary education, existing of schools from multiple school groups. Their mentor uh, is a really strong, innovative school, uh, one of our strongest in GEO network. And they have a bring your own device project already running for five years. In Hub3, uh, also secondary schools and also multi, uh, multiple school groups. Um, but there are more innovative schools, not only the mentor, but also tr some trainee schools are also strong. And their focus is really that personalized learning, um, self-regulation and so on. And then we have a fourth hub, primary schools, 
also existing uh, of schools out of multiple school groups, but the schools are located in and around Brussels. There is a really urban context. So this will be also interesting. Okay, uh, Enrique, I think I'm done. Um, thank you for uh, your time. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for sharing with us. And also because I think uh, Go provides a very good example of how the Dimensi project is uh, making efforts in building in, um, how to say, in already existing networks and initiatives. No, it's not about uh, reinventing the wheel, but actually building on, on what we um, already have at, at, the, at the national level and then uh, see how we can further encourage this kind of, uh, of practices uh, to where, where existing or development uh, where they are not at present. Um, thank you, Sam. I'm going to give now the, the, the floor to, to our next speaker and then we can pick up the questions from the, from the audience at the, at the end of the session. So next we have uh, Yusi Canela from Indire. Uh, Yusi, give me a second and I will try to give you also rights for the, for the presentation. Thank you, Enrique. And good now morning. you should be able to manage it, yep. Okay, uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to describe uh, in the, uh, just in a sort of uh, very short presentation uh, what, we are, wh what we are working on about uh, the small and rural school, but I'm not sure on how to move the, um, the presentation. I, I, I'm not able to change the slides. So just as a second, so if you go to the bottom uh, left part, you will see there's some arrows and you will be able to, to manage them. Bottom left of the presentation, you have to be. Mm. If you go here, you can see my Okay. Yep. There you can see it appears exactly there. Perfect. Okay. So um, last year we started uh, working with the European School Net um, to a possible network, uh, European network of, sm of small and rural school, because in Italy we have been working since 2006 uh, with a group of uh, rural school um, based all over the country, mainly on the island and on the mountains. And we started this activity with an initial survey that we proposed to the following countries that we, uh, with the European School Net, uh, identified as possible interested to these uh, networking activities. Um, the situation that we, we let's say, um, read about the different country uh, is a summary summarized as follow. So um, none of the country in, that uh, responded to the to the survey have systemic action uh, for the small and rural school except Sweden as you can uh, can read in the slide. Um, some of them have some initiative uh, uh, Italy is one but also Spain, Switzerland, Poland and France. And uh, all of them um, have the challenge, uh, have difficulties in facing uh, and the, the multi-age classroom, especially uh, in terms of managing the curriculum activities. And uh, finally, the majority of the respondents suggest that uh, they will be uh, keen and uh, interested in uh, being part of, of a European network of small and rural school. And in order to um, to go in depth uh, into the context, the different context, uh, we, um, as indeed I mean, uh, proposed to use a format as, uh, to investigate, as I said, more in depth, uh, a format uh, of case study and uh, use the following dimension, the, the leadership and management, the teaching strategies, the use of ICT to overcome isolation and all Um, the following research dimension as, uh, let's say, um, contest to identify the real innovation, the real need and uh, uh, need and uh, positive aspect of each country. 
uh, each dimension had some sub dimension. For example, for the leadership and management, we try to uh, catch the school vision of the different school that we uh, interviewed. Or the ICT, if uh, they, the single school used ICT to overcome isolation, to, uh, to uh, if it, they use it, for example, distance learning or remote teaching, etc. One element that we try to intercept to identify is the use of, uh, uh, for example, the participation to European projects such as the Twinning and uh, Erasmus Plus uh, project because they had a, a sort of direct and indirect impact as far for as far as the direct impact uh, deals with the uh, collaboration with other countries uh, to improve the uh, linguistic competences and also the use of ICT. But um, as well as this uh, aspect, this feature, uh, the school that took part to international to in yeah, Erasmus and, uh, and uh, each winning project um, improved their, uh, for example, um, context condition or the uh, learning uh, activity or uh, for their, their, their um, setting, their space, school space. However, uh, could you, okay. So at the moment we, we, we did uh, the following interview and uh, also we tried to uh, put the, the, the result in, in reports. Uh, we are going on, of course, uh, with uh, with other interview and uh, um, okay. Oops, previous one. No, see, sorry. Uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, this is this slide summarizes what emerged from the different uh, country that we in the school that we interviewed. As for teaching strategies as school curriculum, we identified, as I, as we said, as we as I said just before, that one of the challenges the classroom management, and so they use, for example, differentiation and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, activity among among the students. Uh, another aspect is, for example, the use of the or weekly plan or the use of the outdoor learning uh, activities. Uh, as far as uh, ICT and distance education is concerned, uh, all of them use the ICT uh, during this pandemic time. And also, for example, they uh, use uh, the digital resources for multi-age students uh, in order to, um, to design personalized activity. And also, for, as uh, um, uh, widespread, the use of laptop and interactive whiteboard. As far as the uh, leadership and management, uh, many of them have uh, a vision, a school vision. They use a sort of distributed leadership. So they, uh, as I said, um, have a team uh, of teacher uh, and colleague, uh, school teams that uh, is uh, organized in classroom, classroom council or school quality team, etc., uh, in order to manage um, the vision of the school. And finally, uh, all of them are um, yeah, in, interested in networking, uh, particularly in sharing practices among a sc school of the same, uh, with the same situation, so uh, with difficulties uh, uh, in, uh, in connection or, in, for example, another element of uh, that, that, that um, is common among small and rural schools is the uh, difficult connectivity, the, the poor connectivity. And um, so uh, networking is uh, an element that is uh, organized not, all see among, not only among schools, but also uh, with, with, with parents, for example, or with other schools in the local neighborhood. So um, in order to match, let's say, the interest um, of the small and rural school network and the Mensi um, aim, we are working, trying to selecting among the, the Mensi school some of the, from our side, uh, small and rural school uh, that have the following uh, um, policy uh, policy challenges. 
such as multi-age classroom or for example the necessity to to network with other with other school or to use ict to overcome distance distance learning so we are in this phase of selection of a school and identify the four the four cluster school cluster among ad, advanced school uh, for so for the uh, men mentor school we will select uh, we'll try to select uh, uh, two uh, small and rural school and two urban school that are really advanced. That's that's is it. I think I concluded. Okay, my presentation. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you so much, um, Lucy, for sharing with us. Also, because this um, helps us giving again one example while the while the Mensi. Uh, a project is focusing in, in, in ICT and in digital innovation from the mentoring perspective, but we are also um, uh, targeting the specific policy challenges that are of the interest of the of our ministers of education and, and other regional authorities participating in the in the project. And this, you know, also helps us provide us the type of activities that, that we can uh, run and also what's interesting uh, from our side at the level of the of the project. Um, now we have, uh, so thank you, thank you, Jussi, again for your presentation. Now we have a couple of minutes for discussion and questions. I would very much like to pick up on the question that we left uh, before um, in relation to uh, to digital fatigue, and and I think uh, it's it's very much welcome also because it's something that was already identified at the. At the time of the proposal writing of the of the project, um, and and I think it's also um, very relevant to the discussion today, as we would like you all to become uh, advisory members of the project, and this is certainly something that uh, will be recurrent in in our discussions in the future from here uh, and out to the project because it, it was a reality uh, already in in 2020, uh, sorry, in 2019, but I think it became more of a reality last year and it's still the case, not only because of the of the current situation, uh, but also because of everything that involves uh, digital innovation and ICT development in, in schools. So I, I'm going to read the question just in case to make sure that I'm not leaving anything, but uh, uh, the IT mentioned that the, the pandemic exposed the global frailties that exist uh, in, for example, digital capacity in schools, mentoring in in many countries, in some countries may become uh, traditionally focused with a top-down approach to provide teaching and learning. As a result, as a result mentor, uh, mentoring, as we ought to know, has led to serious digital fatigue amongst professionals, which is what we were discussing. How can we regain the confidence in the six, six aspects of effective mentoring as outlined? So maybe Roger, you would like to pick up, and then I will open the floor um, to everyone else. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, another fascinating question. I think the answer is, in a way, is shown by Juicy's presentation and Sam's, in that um, our focus isn't digital technology per se. We're not saying, "Hey guys, why don't you use interactive whiteboards or cloud computing?" We're saying much more. Uh, what problems are you facing um, in your day-to-day -day work, and um, how can working with other schools, aided by technology, help overcome them? Uh, and we, we hope, and, and we know, it's times are difficult with COVID and so on. But um, sensitive approach is very important, and it's it's about support and. Um, encouragement and morale uh, as much as intervention, let's say. Thank you, uh, Roger. Of course, uh, I, I'm not going to assign now the, the questions, but uh, Sam and Yusi, whatever you feel that uh, you would like to intervene, please do so. There is there is also a direct question, um, and I would, uh, of course, please do not hesitate to remind me if I'm missing anything because there's many questions now in the chat. I think the next one is targeted directly to the presentation of uh, um, of uh, UC, and they are asking if there's any report already in relation to these uh, case studies uh, that has been published. Uh, so, UC, would you like to, to, to pick up? Uh, 
Uh, yes, some more word about, about uh, the, the case study. Uh, would you like to descri I describe the situation of the case study? I, I think they are asking if there's, I'm not sure, I think they're asking if there's already anything public uh, that has been made public in terms of the results. Not, not at the moment, not at the moment. Mm -hmm. At the end of the process, so we will, uh, we will, uh, European School Net will publish uh, a report, a final report that will collect all the case study to a 24 case study that we are going to uh, collect. We are interviewing uh, in the, in this year. We are in, in so uh, at the ALF, the ALF uh, um, country interview collected until now. So for the moment, it is an internal, an internal, let's say, work. Uh, we met the, the, the country interested and uh, just uh, described the situation and the result that we collected. But uh, at the moment, it's something that stay uh, inside the European uh, European school net. Thank you, Jesse. Then maybe also for both of you, uh, because already Roger has already reser uh, referred in relation to the previous question about digital fatigue, because uh, you have both quite some experience, uh, both at the level of Indire with the different initiatives that you have with Avanguardia uh, Educative, uh, and then uh, some you also mentioned that you have already many initiatives at the level of uh, not only digital innovation, but also ICT infrastructure development. So maybe you can also share a bit more about your experiences and how Yes. Uh, okay. We we can say that uh, Mensi is something that uh, um, um, for, from from our experience uh, happen in a moment where the school are ready to be mentored. Let's say to be accompanied in a process of innovation. In Indira, we we started many initiatives in the last uh, ten year to promote innovation among school. Innovation in terms of uh, uh, school organization, innovation in terms of use of ICT, uh, integrated and invisible in the classroom activity, uh, innovation in terms of, uh, um, for example, personalization of uh, uh, learning activity, and in terms of using, for example, the curriculum to promote the, the local context, specifically for the small and rural school, because for them, the local context is something that um, is inside the different person and should be evaluated, should be valorized, should be promoted. And so, um, in, as far as, uh, for example, avant-garde educative, educational avant-garde, uh, they are a group of school, at the moment a movement and uh, a network at national level that uh, are based in urban, mainly in urban uh, context, uh, so big school that pro promoted and changed the le learning setting, the learning environment in terms of time, space and teaching activities. And this involved the entire institution, school institution, not just one or two teachers, but uh, the, um, from the um, school leader uh, to the students. And this is something that uh, uh, took, of course, uh, from three to five years, school year, to, to involve the entire institution and to, move, to change the, the school organization and come from the, uh, from the bottom, not from the top, so not from the ministry, neither for, from Indire, but from the school in, per se, from the school itself. And also uh, other aspect that would be of something interest at, uh, is that at the end of the, um, let's say, investigation of the innovation that we did, the school did networking, did mentoring between them. So if a school uh, is an excellence, for example, in using ICT or in uh, a specific teaching strategies, teaching activity, other school, either in the local neighborhood, let's say in the context in the same region or in another region of the country, contacted the school and asked it to be to, to work or to, to do some kind of um, um, let's learning, um, peer learning among teacher. And so they uh, asked, for example, from um, tools, from advice, suggestion, or now to implement the, the same idea in their school. This is a kind of mentoring that we promoted and that we also in, um, yeah, uh, investigated uh, um, 
in, in our school, either in the urban school and in the small and rural school. As far as the small and rural school is concerned, we have a, a project and a, a movement dedicated to this in order to uh, share to let the schools share among them uh, teaching practices, difficulties, and also because we uh, realize that uh, uh, networking is a strength for the school themselves. If they are all together, they could be, uh, a, they have a, a, a clear identity because they are set, they are based in a specific part of the country and have the same difficulties, for example, connectivity, because uh, one of the difficulties that, that school experienced in the, during this uh, pandemic time was the poor connectivity that uh, just in the last few months uh, has improved. Uh, specifically for this uh, small and rural school. Another difficulty is, is the um, teachers, uh, um, teacher move from, uh, from school to school and they, they, they leave the small and rural school to, to move in a urban school. And this is uh, something that uh, has negative uh, impact on the small schools uh, due to the uh, poor curriculum and uh, yeah, poor curriculum of uh, so the situation is complex, but Mensi could be a resource, could be an opportunity for the school, either for the urban and big school to uh, transfer experience, a good practice to, to, to share experience and a good practice with other school and for the small and rural school that start experiencing and uh, um, having uh, having idea that uh, something can change if they work in pair, I mean, in terms of school and uh, teacher, uh, yeah, teachers. Thank you, I would like to say something about uh, digital fatigue. Um, so it's really important that we keep it in mind. But um, for our country, we did really a lot of things. Um, there is a lot of money invested in in, the, in more working more digital. Um, but now it's the perfect time to uh, sum up what did we do good, what did we can do. What can we do better, and how can we reach uh, the better uh, the better things? And um, it's for us the the timeline of the Mansi project is perfect match. Um, schools have not a time to do the selfie test um, to see what what's going great, and then to learn together uh, in groups in in their hubs uh, from from each other and take step by step. Uh, because yeah, we we had um, we had um, yeah. Students had to uh, had to ha had lessons at home, but now they're going back to schools and we're, we're looking for a blended way of, 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 of learning. Um, so that's one thing that's really important. Also, the hubs, um, I will I will speak with the hubs and, and look for a perfect um, for, for perfect um, balance between digital uh, coming together digital, but also to visit each other's schools. I think it's really important. I hope that uh, next year will be a bit normal, more normal, um, so we can visit each other's schools, but also uh, keep in touch online. Thank you, Sam. Maybe I will pick up a couple of the more um, technical questions because there is also some, um, and, and we already have, I think, one minute left of the scheduled time for the for the webinar. So we'll try also to to get back to you with everything. Um, so uh, again, there's a question by Alessandro. I think it was um, in relation to the to the piloting phase of of, uh, of selection of schools and so on. So um, well, the, the schools that have been uh, selected for the piloting phase have been done so through the partners, but of course. Yes, there is the possibility to to join the project in in, in future stages uh, in two ways uh, via the international activities that we will be running not only um, as the move but also the other ones linked to the online community. And then it goes without saying that we are still uh, working in designing how this um, implementation at the national. Uh, level would take place or so what kind of activities will be possible, which ones not, uh, how can we deal with other schools interested in the project after the piloting phase uh, has finalized, etc. And that's of course one of the reasons why it would be good uh, to have uh, further contributions for the advisory members, because when we have this type of discussion, it's also good uh, to have uh, input from the 
from the outside. Um, this is maybe also connected to the other question by uh, Christian uh, in relation to the selection of schools. Yes, there was a uh, common criteria stated uh, and decided within the consortium how we were selecting the, the schools uh, in relation to the topic, but also to the interest of schools. But it goes without saying that in any case, the selection process has been done taking into consideration the national and regional realities. So, of course, we understand that it's you cannot apply every same single rule uh, for this kind of initiatives at the national level. So we, we have also left uh, quite some flexibility in terms of how the partners were proceeding, were proceeding in the selection of schools uh, and the different topics and challenges uh, like the ones that have been presented today uh, according to their interests. And uh, let me see, I'm going to very quickly sweep to the questions to see if we can cover one or two more. Um, OK, so Angela Suriano, um, in relation to the application, I understand that it's uh, for, for the advising members. This is still open, and I'm assuming we are going to leave it uh, uh, open throughout the project. Of course, the intention is for you to be involved from the very beginning. Um, but in any case, we will be following up with you after the end of the of the webinar, we will send a follow up email with the reminders on the deadlines, the registration form, so that uh, you can also share this information with other uh, colleagues or organizations that may be interested in, in joining us as advisory uh, uh, members. Um, then I see a follow up from uh, Daiti in relation to the work done. Um, in Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, India, Nepal. Um, just um, the only mentor that seems to be welcomed by schools is <laughs> Mother Nature, as mentor and outside the connectivity of the human spirit. I know this is outside of the box, but the reality is that there is a strong move to mentor, mentor empathetic, soulful, reconnection first, and then move forward with mentoring as we know it. Thoughts? Will Menzi go there? Well, uh, I think it's a bit uh, early still to see where we will be able to go and what we will reach. But again, I, I think it, you make an excellent point, and, and this is the type of discussion that we want to have uh, within the within the advisory members. The truth and the reality, and, and this is something that myself as a as a teacher I always uh, mention is that we haven't got the answers for any for everything. No, uh, it's it's going to be part of the of the learning process of the project. And, and through the activities that we run, we also look forward to answer to some of these uh, questions. Um, OK. Um, OK. Well, yes, there's a specific questions. Uh, as I said, I think this is again, Angela, in terms of how the activities will be organized at the national level. It's it's early to say at this stage uh, when we are talking about this type of contributions, it's the kind of activities that we are aiming to run, but uh, uh, we are finalizing yet the, the selection process of school. So how the activities will be organized at the national level and, and, uh, and, and how we will be involving those advisory members that we are lucky enough to have it within the same countries or not, that will be decided at a later stage. But of course, being part of the advisory members and joining us in the General Assemblies will give you uh, the floor to speak and, 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 to, and to give input in this regard and, and to design the activities accordingly. Um, what does uh, it imply to become an advisory uh, board member? Well, uh, we didn't specify, of course, in terms of responsibilities. Uh, this is, of course, uh, an advisory board, so the, uh, there's no legal responsibilities as such, but of course, we are aiming you to join, uh, first and foremost, our general assemblies, because this is where we provide um, an overall picture of the activities that have been run during the year. But the, the idea is that you're also going to be a, a preferential uh, body. This is where we are going to be sending all the information in advance, making sure that we are going in the right direction, uh, taking also advice that we can then go back to the commission when we are providing reports, etc. So, of course, there's no uh, compulsory activities, but the more engaged we, we, 
we managed to have you within the different project activities, the, the best. Uh, and I also um, I thank you, Elena, because she has referred again you to the to the charter of the advisory members, so that you have a more uh, close idea of how we are going to be working uh, from a, from an administrative uh, matter perspective. Sorry. Um, so okay, I think we are running quite late already, but that's good because it means that there's been uh, quite some good discussion. Um, thank you for the positive comments too in the chat. Uh, I think we will wrap up uh, now. I would like in any case to share with you the project email. You can see it now in the screen uh, and my personal email in case you want to refer any specific questions about uh, the membership, etc. You can do so directly to my email, uh, enrique.martin at un.org. Um, we will follow up with you in any case via email uh, for those of you that participated in the webinar and those of you that have already registered uh, as advisory members, um, so don't 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 be worried because it will be in the coming in the coming days. Otherwise, I can only buy. But thank you for joining us uh, today, and not only for joining us, but also for participating in the in the discussion that I think that has been very very healthy and productive. Um, so we will keep in touch and we will keep you informed on the next steps. And again, thank you to our speakers and thank you everyone for joining us today.